Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I ask that the quorum call be vitiated and uh, without objection. Allowed to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, this is a pivotal moment in the history of our country. In the coming days and weeks, decisions will be made about our national budget that will impact the lives of virtually every American in this country for decades to come. And the time is now for the American people to become significantly involved in that debate and not leave it to a small number of people here in Washington. Mr. President, at a time when the wealthiest people and the largest corporations in our country are doing phenomenally well, and in many cases have never had it so good. While the middle class is disappearing and poverty is increasing, it is absolutely imperative that any deficit reduction package that passes this Congress not include the horrendous cuts, the cruel cuts, in programs that working people desperately need that are utilized every day by the elderly, by the sick, by our children, and by the lowest income people in our country, that the Republicans in Congress, dominated by their extreme right wing, are demanding. America is not about giving tax breaks to billionaires and attacking the most vulnerable people in our country. We must not allow that to happen. In my view, the President of the United States needs to stand with the vast majority of the American people and say no to the Republican leadership and make it clear that enough is enough. No, we will not balance the budget on the backs of the most vulnerable people in this country on our children, on our seniors, on the sick. No, we will not do that. Working families in this country have already sacrificed enough in terms of lost jobs, lost wages, lost homes, lost pensions. The working families of this country are hurting right now. Enough is enough. But, Mr. President, now is the time to say to the millionaires and the billionaires in this country and to the largest corporations, who in many ways have never had it so good, that they must participate in deficit reduction, that there must be shared sacrifice, that deficit reduction cannot be based on cutting back on the needs of working families and the middle class, but the rich and large corporations have also got to participate in this process. Furthermore, it is absolutely necessary, if we are talking about a sensible deficit reduction package, that we take a hard look at unnecessary and wasteful spending at the Pentagon. And Mr. President, let us make it very clear that we will not be blackmailed again by the Republican leadership in Washington who are threatening to destroy the full faith and credit of the United States government so that for the very first time in our nation's history, we might not pay the bills that we owe. That is their threat. We will destroy the record of always paying our bills, never failing to do that, unless they get everything they want. Instead of yielding to the incessant, extreme Republican demands, as the President, in many respects, did last, in last December's tax cut agreement and this year's spending negotiations, the President has got to get out of the beltway. He has to connect with the needs of working families and ordinary Americans and rally 
the overwhelming majority of our people who believe that deficit reduction must be based on shared sacrifice, that the wealthy and the powerful and the large corporations cannot continue to get everything they want while we wage a cruel and unprecedented attack on the vulnerable, most vulnerable people in this country. It is time for President Obama to stand with the millions who have already lost their jobs, their homes, their life savings, instead of the millionaires who in many cases have never had it so good. Unless the American people in huge numbers tell the President not to yield one inch to Republican demands to destroy Medicare and Medicaid while continue to provide tax breaks to the wealthy and the powerful, unless the American people rise up and say enough is enough, I am afraid that what will happen is the President will yield once again and the wealthy and the powerful will laugh all the way to the bank while working people will be devastated. So today I am asking the American people that if you believe that deficit reduction should be about shared sacrifice, if you believe that the wealthiest people in our country and the largest corporations should be asked to pay their fair share as part of deficit reduction, if you believe that at a time when military spending has almost tripled since 1997, that we begin to take a hard look at our defense budget. And if you believe that the middle class and working families have already sacrificed enough, I urge you to make sure that the President hears your voice and he needs to hear it now. I would urge the American people to go to my website, sanders.senate.gov, and sign a letter to the President letting him know that enough is enough. I would also urge the American people to contact the White House directly through their West, we, website and leave a message for the President there. As you know, Mr. President, this country faces enormous challenges. In fact, we have not suffered through such a difficult moment since the Great Depression of the 1930s. The reality is that we don't talk about it very much, but the reality is that the middle class in this country is disappearing, while at the same time, poverty is increasing. When we talk about the state of our economy, and it is important to talk about it within the context of deficit reduction, because when you understand what's going on in the economy, you know that you can't get blood out of a stone. You cannot keep attacking people who have been devastated in the last few years in terms of unemployment, in terms of losses of pension, in terms of losses of health care. So when we talk about the economy, we have got to understand that the situation is in many cases even worse than official statistics indicate. For example, we read in the papers that the official unemployment rate is now 9.1%. But the truth of the matter is, and no economist disagrees with this, that that official statistic ignores the number of people who have given up looking for work and people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time. If you add all of that together, you're looking at a real unemployment rate in this country of about 16%. 16%. Are those really the people that we should go to for deficit reduction? Are they not suffering enough right now? Young people graduating college can't find a job. Let's hit them hard. Older people have lost their jobs can't find a new one or working for half the wages that they previously worked at. Let's go after those people. 50 million people have no health insurance. Let's attack them. Working mothers and fathers can't find affordable childcare. Let's go after them. Mr. President, 
We must understand that when we look at the economy, the middle class is hurting and hurting badly. Over the last 10 years, on top of the high unemployment rates, the median family income in this country has declined by over $2,500. You know why working families are angry? That's why they're angry. They're working longer hours for lower wages. And are those really the people that you want to ask to balance the budget? I don't think so. I think any sense of fairness, any sense of morality that one might have suggests you don't beat up on people who are already suffering. You don't try to get blood out of a stone. Mr. President, as a result of the greed and the recklessness and the illegal behavior on Wall Street, which caused this terrible recession. Millions more Americans have lost their homes, they've lost their pensions, and they've lost their retirement savings. We hear it every day in calls that come to our offices. And unless we reverse our current economic course, our children will have, for the very first time in modern American history, a lower standard of living than their parents. It's the American dream in reverse. Kids are going to do worse than their parents unless we reverse current economic trends. Mr. President, we can throw out a lot of numbers around here, a few hundred billion and a trillion, but the truth of the matter is that behind those numbers in my state of Vermont and all over this country, there are real people who are hurting terribly. And as members of the United States Senate, our job is to pay attention to those people and not just the well-paid lobbyists representing the most powerful special interests in the world who surround this capital every single day. Mr. President, last year I asked my constituents in Vermont to share some personal stories with me. I asked them basically, you know, how are you doing in this recession? And the stories that I got back from Vermont, I am sure, are absolutely similar to the stories that you would get in Delaware or anyone would get in Michigan or any other state in this country. But I asked them, how are things going? And let me just tell you that uh, as a result of the email that we sent out, we had more than 400 Vermonters responding to that email. And what they had to say was, was poignant. Sometimes these stories were so powerful it was almost hard to read more than a few at a time. And the messages that I received from Vermont, and I suspect similar messages coming from every state in this country, is that people are finding it hard to get jobs or are now working for lower wages than they used to earn. We're seeing older workers who have depleted their life savings and they're worried about how they're, going, <clears throat> how they're going to retire, what happens to them when they're unable to work anymore, who's going to take care of them? We hear from young adults in their 20s and 30s who are deeply in debt from college loans, and they don't know how they're going to pay off those loans. We hear from people of all ages, all walks of life, from every corner of Vermont who have sent us their stories. And let me just read a few of them, just to make the point, to put some flesh and blood behind the statistics that we often throw out. We got a letter from a 51-year-old woman from central Vermont, and this is what she wrote. She said, Dear Senator Sanders, don't really know what to say. I could cry. My significant other was out of work for a year. Now he works in another state. I've been out of work since April. Our mortgage company wants the house because we can't make the payments. I can't find a job to save my soul that will pay enough to make a difference. How bad does it have to get? My mother went through the Great Depression, and here we go again. I figure that I'm going to lose everything soon. I'm a well-educated person who can't see through the fog." End of quote. A gentleman in his mid-50s writes from Orange County, Vermont, and this is what he writes. After being unemployed three times since 1999 due to global trade agreements, I now find myself managing a hazardous waste transfer facility that pays about 25 percent less than what I was making in 1999. And Mr. President, you hear that all of the time. Yes, many people, of course, are working. 
but many older workers today are dealing with the humiliation and the economic tragedy of now earning substantially less than they earned 10 or 20 years ago. And he continues, my wife's children have moved back in unemployed and we are saving very little for retirement. If things don't improve soon, we will likely have to work until we die. We consider ourselves lucky that we are employed. Our children's friends tend to show up around mealtime. They are skinny, we feed them. This is no recession, it's a modern day depression. Mr. President, are those the people that we really want to go after when we talk about deficit reduction? Are they not suffering enough already? A woman in her late 40s from Westminster, Vermont writes, quote, I'm a single mom in Vermont, nearly 50. I patched together a full-time job making $12 an hour and various painting jobs and still can't afford to get myself out of debt or make necessary repairs on my home. No other jobs in sight. I apply all the time to no avail. Food and gas bills go up and up, but not my income. I have no retirement at all. Can't afford to move, feeling stuck, tired, and hopeless. Stuck, tired, and hopeless. I suspect that sentiment reflects how many, many millions of Americans are feeling today. Got another letter from a 26-year-old man from Barrie, Vermont, and he writes, quote, in 2002, I received a scholarship to St. Bonaventure University, the first in my family to attend college. Upon graduation in 2006, I was admitted to the Dickinson School of Law at Penn State University and graduated in 2009 with $150,000 of student loan. $150,000. That's high. But there are people all over this country who have extremely high student loans and they don't know how they're going to pay them off. And then he continues, in Western New York, I could find nothing better than a $10 an hour position stuffing envelopes. I live in a small studio apartment in Barrie without cable or internet. I've told my family I don't want them to visit because I am ashamed of my surroundings. My family always told me that an education was the ticket to success. But all my education seems to have done in this landscape is make it impossible to pull myself out of debt and begin a successful career, end of quote. Mr. President, on and on it goes. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing in my office on the crisis in dental care, the fact that in Vermont and all over this country, we've got millions of people who can't find a dentist. I just want to give you an idea. I'm raising these issues today, and I'm quoting from folks in Vermont. And by the way, again, these stories are not just Vermont. Vermont, in fact, is doing better in this recession than most states in the country are. So take what we're talking about here in Vermont and multiply it several times for other states. But a gentleman writes to me just within the last couple of weeks. He says, I can't afford health insurance, so death, dental work is definitely out. Uh, and, and he talks about how uh, studies have linked bad dental care to heart problems and cancer, but he can't get to a dentist. So Mr. President, the reason I raise these issues is to try to give us a better understanding of who some of the people are that will be impacted by the draconian cuts that the Republicans are talking about. Let us be clear. They are talking about throwing millions and millions of people off of Medicaid. And let me tell you what that means. Earlier this year, as you know, Arizona passed budget cuts that took patients off its transplant list. Remember reading about that? Most of the country read about that. And essentially, because of financial reasons, what they said in Arizona is, yes, you need a transplant. Yes, you are not all that old. But I'm sorry, we can't afford it for you. And you're going to have to die. And people have died. And in that state and in other states throughout this country, Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are being thrown off of Medicaid. So what does that mean? What does it mean if you are a low-income worker and you are getting your health insurance through Medicaid and you lose that Medicaid? What happens when you develop a pain in your chest and you think you may be having a heart problem, but you can't get to a doctor? What happens? Have our Republican friends thought that through? when they propose $700 billion in cuts in Medicaid? What happens to the children by the millions 
who were thrown off of Medicaid. We have 50 million people today who have no health insurance. If the Republican plan goes through, we're talking about tens of millions more. What happens to those people? As Americans, are we content to see kids get sick because they can't get to a doctor? Or people die because they don't get to a doctor on time? I don't think so. Mr. President, I have learned and been told throughout my whole life that education is the key to success. And we hear that on the floor of this Senate every single day. Education, education. Kids have got to do well in high school so they'll be able to go to college. The reality right now is that hundreds of thousands of bright young people cannot afford to go to college because they just don't have the money. And as a nation, we are losing their intellectual capabilities to make us a stronger nation. If the Republicans get their way and make savage cuts in Pell Grants, there is no doubt, no one has any doubt, that hundreds of thousands more young people will never be able to walk in to a college or a university. And that is not only a tragedy for the individuals, for the young people themselves, it is a tragedy for this nation. Every day we are involved in fierce competition in the global economy, and we are not doing well at educational levels. We are seeing other countries graduate more of their students from college, and that gap is growing wider, and if you cut back on Pell Grants and other forms of college aid, it is clear that a bad situation will be made much worse. But let's get even more basic, more basic than health care, more basic than education, and that comes to nutrition. Whether people in larger and larger numbers in this country are going to go hungry. Mr. President, according to a 2009 study, there are over 5 million seniors who face the threat of hunger, almost 3 million who are at risk of going hungry, and almost 1 million seniors who do go hungry because they cannot afford to buy food. And in that context, our Republican friends want to balance the budget on the backs of the hungry, cut back on food stamps, cut back on other nutrition programs. So what happens if you're 80 and food prices are going up and you don't have enough to eat? Well, apparently there are some people here in the Senate who don't worry about that, but I personally do not believe that that is what America is about, and I think the American people, by huge numbers, do not want to see hunger increased for our seniors or our children. Mr. President, this is a lot of pain that the Republicans are tossing out while at the same time they are vigorously protecting their wealthy and powerful friends. In my view, the President of the United States has got to stand tall. He has got to take the case to the American people and he has got to hold the Republicans responsible if, in fact, the debt ceiling is not raised and all of the repercussions that will occur if that happens. Mr. President, I've given you just an inkling of what is going on in the real world, and I know all over this country, uh, ordinary Americans, working class people have a lot more to say about what is going on in their lives. As we speak, people are fighting desperately to keep their homes from falling into foreclosure. They're struggling with 29, 30 percent interest rates on their credit card, which they're never able to pay off. Marriages have been postponed because the young people don't have the money to settle down. Lives have been derailed. Retirement savings have been raided to pay for college tuition or to keep businesses afloat or to simply put gas in the car at 380 a gallon in order to get to work. That is what is going on in the real world. That is what it means 
when we talk about the middle class collapsing and poverty is increasing. And Mr. President, while all of that happens, it is important to note that there is another, another economic reality taking place in this country. Poverty is increasing. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. We're seeing an increase in senior citizens who are going hungry, more and more families unable to send their kids to college. But there is another reality out there, and that is that the gap between the wealthiest people in this country and everybody else is growing wider and wider and has not been this wide since the Great, just before the Great Depression of 1929 began. And let us be very clear, and there's nothing to be proud about, but the United States today has by far the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth. Today, Mr. President, the top 1% earns over 20% of all income in this country, which is more than the bottom 50%. 1% owns more income than the bottom 50%. Over a recent 25-year period, 80% of all new income created in this country went to the top 1%. Even more dramatic, even more incredible, even more unfair in terms of distribution of wealth, which is accumulated income, as hard as it may be to comprehend, in America today, the top 400 individuals own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. 400 Americans own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. Now, Mr. President, given those realities, it doesn't take a PhD in economics to suggest that when we move forward with deficit reduction, that deficit reduction must include shared sacrifice, that the wealthy and large corporations also have got to help this country deal with record-breaking deficit. Mr. President, the reality is simple but unfortunate. And that reality is that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class continues to disappear. And that is what is going on in this country, and there is no hiding it. We have got to acknowledge it, and we've got to go on from there. Mr. President, everyone knows that in our country today, we are facing a major deficit crisis, and we have a national debt of over $14 trillion. What has not been widely discussed, and what must be discussed, is how we got into that deficit situation in the first place. If you're going to deal with a deficit, you've got to know how you got into it. And what is very, very clear is that this huge record-breaking deficit and a $14 trillion national debt did not just happen overnight, and it didn't happen by accident. It happened, in fact, as a result of a number of policy decisions made over the last decade and votes that were cast right here on the floor of the Senate and in the House of Representatives. When we talk about the deficit and when we talk about the national debt, let us never forget that in January of 2001, a little over 10 years ago, when President Bill Clinton left office, this country had an annual federal budget surplus, surplus of $236 billion with projected budget surpluses as far as the eye could see. That was when Clinton left office some 10 years ago. And now we have a $1.5 trillion deficit and a growing national debt. It is totally appropriate, as we talk about deficit reduction, that we ask the simple question, 
How did we get to where we are today in terms of the deficit? What happened in that ensuing 10 years? How did we go from huge projected surpluses into horrendous debt? And the answer, Mr. President, really is not complicated and there's not a lot of disagreement. We know exactly what has happened. The Congressional Budget Office has documented it. There was an interesting article on the front page of the Washington Post on April 30th talking about it as well. And here's what happened. And I don't think there's a lot of disagreement about this. Mr. President, when our nation spends a trillion dollars on wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and forgets to pay for those wars, we run up a deficit. When we provide over $700 billion in tax breaks to the wealthiest people in this country and choose not to offset those tax breaks, we run up a deficit. When we pass a Medicare Part D prescription drug program written by the drug companies and the insurance companies that does not allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices and ends up costing us far more than it should, $400 billion over a 10-year period, and we don't pay for that, we run up the deficit. When we double military spending since 1997, not including the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we don't pay for that, we run up the deficit. Now, Mr. President, I always find it amusing that when some of my Republican colleagues come down here onto the floor and they lecture some of us about how serious the deficit is and how serious the national debt is. And yet, ironically, many of us voted against those proposals which, in fact, caused the deficit crisis that we are in right now. And I paid a lot of attention during the debate over the war in Iraq. I don't recall many of our friends on the Republican side or the Democrats who voted for that war saying, gee, we can't go to war because it's going to cost this country a huge sum of money. Don't remember hearing that. And when we bailed out Wall Street to the tune of $700 billion, don't recall many of my friends saying, oh, my goodness, we can't afford to do that. And when we gave $700 billion in tax breaks to the wealthiest people in this country, where was the concern then about deficit reduction? And further, Mr. President, and maybe even most significantly, the deficit that we're in right now was caused by the recession that we're in, which was, of course, caused by the greed and illegal behavior on Wall Street, which caused the economic condition of the moment, massive unemployment, and loss of a very substantial amount of revenue that otherwise would have come into our tax coffers. Mr. President, the end result of all of these unpaid for policies and actions year after year of the deficits I just described is a staggering amount of debt. When President Bush left office, President Obama inherited an annual deficit of $1.3 trillion with deficits as far as the eye could see, and the national debt more than doubled, more than doubled under President Bush because of all of these policy decisions made by Republicans and some Democrats. So the reality is, Mr. President, if we did not go to war in Iraq, if we did not pass huge tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires, if we did not pass a prescription drug program with no cost control written by the drug and insurance companies, and if we did not deregulate Wall Street, which allowed them to do the things that they did, which ended up in Wall Street's collapse and the ensuing recession, we would not find ourselves in the mess we are in today. It really is that simple. 
In other words, the only reason we have to increase our nation, nation's debt ceiling today is that we are forced to pay the bills that the Republican leadership in Congress and some Democrats and President Bush racked up. Now, Mr. President, given the decline in the middle class, given the increase in poverty, and given the fact that the wealthy and large corporations have never had it so good, Americans might find it strange that the Republicans in Washington would use this moment to make savage cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, education, nutrition assistance, and other life and death programs, while at the same time pushing for even more tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations. Unfortunately, while the average American may think this is pretty weird, inside the Beltway that is exactly what happens. And this is very much part of the Republican ideology. Republicans in Washington have never really believed in Medicaid or in Medicare or in federal assistance in education or providing any direct government assistance to those in need. They have always believed that tax breaks for the wealthy and the powerful would somehow miraculously trickle down to every American despite all history and all evidence to the contrary. So in that sense, it is not strange at all that they would use the deficit crisis we are now in as an opportunity for an ideological attack against some of the most vulnerable people in our country. And that, Mr. President, is exactly what the Ryan Republican budget that was passed in the House of Representatives earlier this year and supported by the vast majority of Republicans here in the Senate just last month. That's what that budget is all about. Let me just give you, it's a long budget, let me just give you a few examples of what the Ryan Republican budget would do. The Republican budget passed by the House this year would end Medicare as we know it within 10 years. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimates that under the Ryan proposal in 2022, a private health care plan for a 65-year-old equivalent to Medicare coverage would cost about $20,500. Yet the Republican budget would provide a voucher for only $8,000 of those premiums. Seniors would be on their own to pay the remaining $12,500, a full 61% of the total. Now, how many of the 20 million near elderly Americans who are now ages 50 to 54 will be able to afford that? So let's review what we have. Let's say when you become 65 in 10 years and you are earning or living on $15,000 in Social Security, you are going to be asked to pay $12,500 more for health care than is currently the case. How do you do that? How do you do that? What kind of health care plan are you going to buy when you are old and sick and are given an $8,000 voucher? How many days in the hospital? will you be able to have? You can run up an $8,000 bill in one day, in two days. So this ending of Medicare as we know it, forcing seniors to somehow come up with all kinds of money that in many cases they don't have, will be a disaster for tens of millions of people. The Republican budget would also force four million seniors in this country to pay $3,500 more on average for their prescription drugs by reopening the Medicare Part D donut hole. And that goes into effect as soon as that bill would be passed, if it were to be passed. Under the Republican budget, nearly 2 million children would lose their health insurance over the next five years by cuts to the Children's Health Insurance Program according again to the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. Mr. President, at a time when 50 million Americans have no health insurance, the Republican budget would cut Medicaid 
by over $770 billion, causing millions and millions of Americans to lose their health insurance and cut nursing home assistance in half. Right now, Medicaid pays the lion's share of nursing home care. You make savage cuts in Medicaid. What happens to the elderly who are in nursing homes and what happens to their kids, their children, in terms of trying to provide the help that their parents desperately need? The Republican budget would completely repeal the Affordable Health Care Act, preventing an estimated 34 million uninsured Americans from getting the health insurance they need. And at a time when the cost of college education is becoming out of reach for so many Americans, the Republican budget would slash college Pell Grants by about 60 percent next year alone, reducing the maximum award from 5,500 to 2,100. Mr. President, at a time when over 40 million Americans don't have enough money to feed themselves or their families, the Republican budget would kick some 10 million Americans off of food stamps. Now, what kind of sense of morality is that, that when people today are struggling hard in order to feed themselves, we throw another 10 million people off of food stamps? Mr. President, it is no secret to anyone that our nation's infrastructure is crumbling. The Republican budget passed in the House and supported by all but a handful of Republicans here in the Senate would slash funding for our roads, bridges, rail lines, transit systems, and airports by nearly 40 percent next year alone. And one of two things happen. Either as a result of this, our infrastructure continues to deteriorate, or else hard-pressed cities and towns are going to have to raise property taxes and other regressive taxes in order to come up with a differential. Yet, despite the fact now we talked about cuts in health care, Medicare, Medicaid, education, nutrition, environmental protection. Yet, despite all of those cuts, when it comes to military spending, which has tripled since 1997, the House Republican budget does nothing to reduce unnecessary defense spending. In fact, defense spending would go up by $26 billion next year alone under the Republican plan. Interestingly enough, at a time when the rich are becoming richer, when the effective tax rates for the wealthiest people at 18 percent are about the lowest on record, at a time when the top 2 percent have received hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks, at a time when corporate profits are at an all-time high and major corporations making billions of dollars in profits are not paying a nickel in taxes, my Republican colleagues, in their approach to a deficit reduction, does not ask the wealthiest people in this country or the largest corporations to contribute one penny one penny to a deficit reduction. Poverty is increasing. Republicans cut programs for the most vulnerable people in this country. Middle class is disappearing in need of great help. Republicans cut the safety line off from them. The rich who are getting richer and large corporations making huge profits, and in many cases not paying anything in taxes at all, what their requirement is, is to receive even more in terms of tax breaks. Now, that may make sense to some people. It does not make sense to me. In fact, what the Republicans want to do is provide over $1 trillion in tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires by permanently extending all of the Bush income tax cuts reducing the estate tax for multimillionaires and billionaires, and lowering the top individual and corporate income tax rates from 35 percent to 25 percent. Rich get richer, they get tax breaks. Poor get poorer, they lose the ability to send their kids to college or nutrition programs or health care.
Mr. President, the Republican idea of moving toward a balanced budget is to go after the middle class, working families, and low-income people, and to make sure that millionaires and billionaires and the largest corporations in this country that are in many cases doing phenomenally well right now do not have to share in the sacrifices being made by everybody else. They will be protected. The Republican approach to deficit reduction in Washington is the Robin Hood philosophy in reverse. We take from the poorest people and we give to the richest people. And it's not as if that approach is good for our economy. Mark Zandi, the former economic advisor to John McCain, when he was running for president, has estimated that the Republican budget plan will cost 1.7 million jobs by the year 2014, with 900,000 jobs lost next year alone. The House Republican budget is breathtaking in its degree of cruelty. But don't take my word for it. In a letter to congressional leaders after the House GOP plan was introduced, nearly 200 economists and health care experts wrote, and I quote, turning Medicare into a voucher program would undermine essential protections for millions of vulnerable people. It would extinguish the most promising approaches to curb costs and to improve the American medical care system. End of quotes. As Recline, a columnist at the Washington Post, wrote last April that, and I quote, the budget Ryan released is not courageous or serious or significant. It's a joke and a bad one. For one thing, Ryan's savings all come from cuts, and at least two-thirds of them come from programs serving the poor. The wealthy, meanwhile, would see their taxes lowered, and the Defense Department would escape unscathed. It is not courageous to attack the weak while supporting your party's most inane and damaging fiscal orthodoxies. But the problem isn't just that Ryan's budget is morally questionable, it also wouldn't work. Mr. President, the deficit that we are struggling with right now has been caused by unpaid for wars, tax breaks for the rich, a Medicare Part D prescription drug program written by the insurance companies, the bailout of Wall Street, a declining economy, and less revenue coming into our Treasury. The Republican solution, in quotes, is to balance the budget on the backs of the sick, the elderly, the children, and the poor, to cut back on environmental protection, to cut back on transportation, while providing even more tax breaks to those who don't need it. That is unacceptable, and that is what the American people have got to stop. Mr. President, it is not just wealthy individuals who are making out like bandits. As hard as it may be to believe, some of the largest, most profitable corporations in this country are not only avoiding paying any federal income taxes whatsoever, but they are actually receiving tax rebates from the IRS. And the Republican response to this reality is to provide even more tax breaks to these corporate freeloaders. That may make sense to someone. It does not make sense to me. And what I want to do, Mr. President, and I would ask the unanimous consent to do this, is to uh, introduce a list of a number of corporations who are making huge profits and who are paying virtually nothing in taxes and in some cases getting a rebate. Without objection. Mr. President, let me just briefly read this list of corporate freeloaders. Number one, ExxonMobil, largest oil company in the world. In 2009, ExxonMobil made $19 billion in profits. And not only did ExxonMobil avoid paying any federal income taxes that year, they actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS according to its SEC filings. Well, do you think maybe we might want to ask ExxonMobil to pay a little in taxes so we don't have to throw children off of their health insurance? Maybe. Bank of America, last year Bank of America, largest bank in America, received a $1.9 billion tax refund from the IRS even though it made $1.9 
$4.4 billion in profits and just a couple of years ago received a bailout from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department of nearly $1 trillion. Well, what do you know about that? We're bailing out the largest banks in this country whose greed caused the recession, and then they get a rebate from the IRS rather than paying any taxes. And yet our Republican friends think the solution to deficit reduction is not to ask Bank of America to pay their fair share, but to end Medicare as we know it and force low-income seniors to pay substantially more for their health care. Number three, General Electric. Over the past five years, while General Electric made $26 billion in profits in the U.S., it received a $4.1 billion refund from the IRS. I don't know. What do you think? Think we should ask GE maybe to help us out just a little bit with deficit reduction? Chevron, a major oil company, received a $19 million refund from the IRS after it made $10 billion in profits. Boeing, last year Boeing, which received a $30 billion contract from the Pentagon to build 179 airborne tankers, got a $124 million refund from the IRS. And on and on it goes. Valero Energy, Goldman Sachs. In 2008, Goldman Sachs paid only 1.1% of its income in taxes, even though it earned a profit of $2.3 billion. Gee, most Americans would be pretty happy to pay 1.1% of their income in taxes, but then again, they are not Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, ConocoPhillips, Conoval Cruise Lines, on and on and on. You got large, extremely profitable corporations who either pay nothing in taxes or get a rebate from the IRS. Maybe, just maybe, when we talk about deficit reduction, we might want to ask those people to help us out rather than go after the elderly, the sick, the children, and the poor. Mr. President, large corporations today are sitting on a record-breaking $2 trillion in cash. The problem is not that corporations are taxed too much. The problem is that consumers don't have enough money to buy their products, and the Republican agenda would make that far worse. Corporate tax revenue last year was down by 27 percent compared to 2000, even though corporate profits are up 60 percent over the last decade. These guys make more and more money. Their contribution to the Treasury goes down. Now, when we talk about how we can, in a fair way, in a responsible way, deal with our deficit and our national debt, man, here is one very clear example. Now, here you have in the Cayman Islands, Mr. President, a building, I think it's a four-story building, and it looks like a normal-sized four-story building, and yet it has 18,000 857 companies who call this building their home. Now, one of two things is going on. Either these guys are very, very crowded. I, I, I 18,000 uh, corporations in this one four-story building, maybe they're very crowded and we should call in the zoning people in the Cayman Island to check that out, or maybe something else is going on. And of course, what is going on is this is a total, absolute fraud. This is a building that doesn't house anybody. It's a phony address that 18,000 plus corporations use for the explicit purpose of not paying taxes to the United States of America. There are studies out there which suggest that large corporations and wealthy individuals are avoiding $100 billion in taxes every year by setting up these offshore tax shelters in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and the Bahamas. Maybe, 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 before we tell young people that they can't go to college, or single moms that they can't get childcare for their kids, or low-income seniors that we're going to cut back on their nutrition, maybe, just maybe, we might want to end this blatant outrage which cost us $100 billion every single year. Mr. President, in 2005, one out of four large corporations paid no income taxes at all, even though they collected 
trillion in revenue. What about looking there for revenue? Our Republican friends say, oh, no, no, we can't do that. We've got to force elderly people to pay more in Medicaid, throw kids off of Medicaid. Now, what is a very interesting point, Mr. President, and frankly, we are all politicians. You don't get elected to the Senate if you're not, you don't understand something about politics. What I don't understand, and certainly what President Obama needs to understand, is the overwhelming majority of the American people do not agree with the Republican approach, which says give tax breaks to billionaires and go after the elderly, the sick, the children, and the poor. And that's thus not Bernie Sanders talking. Let me just, I'm not much into polls, to be honest with you, but I think it is important to just try to get a little bit of a reflection of where the American people are coming from. Uh, according to a recent Boston Globe poll, a couple of weeks ago, Boston Globe did a poll in the state of New Hampshire. They're mostly interested in the presidential campaign, how uh, presidential candidates are doing in New Hampshire, but they asked some other questions. In New Hampshire, I know because they're a neighbor of mine, they're the big anti-tax state. They're the conservative state in New England. And here's what the folks in New Hampshire said in that recent poll. 73% support raising taxes on people making over 250,000 a year. 78% oppose cutting Medicare. 71% oppose cutting Medicaid, and 76% oppose cutting Social Security. The Republican approach is just the opposite. Cut Medicare, they want to cut Medicaid, they want to cut Social Security, and they certainly do not want to ask the wealthiest people in this country to pay a nickel more in taxes. Well, that's one poll. Let's look at another poll. In fact, poll after poll has more or less mirrored what New Hampshire voters are saying. A recent NBC News Wall Street Journal poll found the following. 81% of the American people believe it is totally acceptable or mostly acceptable, that's how they frame these polls, to impose a surtax on millionaires to reduce the deficit. Let me repeat that. 81% of the American people in that Wall Street Journal NBC poll think it is totally acceptable or mostly acceptable to impose a surtax on millionaires to reduce the deficit. 81% of the American people think it is a good idea, and yet we can't get one Republican to ask the wealthy to pay a nickel more in taxes. Talk about being out of touch with what the American people want. 74% in that same poll of the American people believe it is totally acceptable or mostly acceptable to eliminate tax credits for the oil and gas industry, and on and on it goes. 76% believe it is totally unacceptable or mostly unacceptable to cut Medicare to significantly reduce the deficit. Now here's an interesting poll that maybe some of my Republican friends want to pay attention to. And that is that while the leaders of the Tea Party here in Washington are fighting to dismantle Medicare and Medicaid, it turns out that in another poll done by McClatchy, 70 percent, 70 percent of those people who identify themselves with the Tea Party oppose cutting Medicare and Medicaid to reduce the deficit. That is the Tea Party. Mr. President, here's the last poll I want to highlight, and there are many more out there, it was done by the Washington Post and ABC News. And here's what that poll says. It says 72% of Americans support raising taxes on incomes over 250000 to reduce the national debt, including 91% of the Democrats, 68% of independents, and 54% of Republicans. So here you have in Congress surrounded by lobbyists and powerful special interests, a Congress heavily dominated by large campaign contributors of members of the Senate moving in exactly the opposite direction of where the American people want to go. The American people want shared sacrifice.
The American people believe that when the wealthiest people in this country are doing phenomenally well and the gap between the rich and everybody else is growing wider, yes, the wealthiest people have got to contribute to deficit reduction. The American people believe that when you have corporations making record-breaking profits and not paying a nickel in taxes, yes, they have got to start paying taxes. And the American people overwhelmingly believe that it is bad for this country to go after Medicare and Medicaid and programs that working families desperately depend upon. Mr. President, instead of listening to millionaires and billionaires, it is time for our leaders here in Washington to start listening to the overwhelming majority of the American people who do want the wealthiest people in this country and the most profitable corporations to contribute to deficit reduction. It is time for shared sacrifice. The middle class, the elderly, the sick, the children, and the poor have already sacrificed enough. It is time for those people on top, the people who are doing extremely well, to also understand that they are Americans, they are part of our country, and they have got to contribute to deficit reduction. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. President, that moving towards deficit reduction in a way that is fair is not as complicated as some would have us believe. In fact, if you are not beholden to Wall Street, large corporations and wealthy campaign contributors, and you are not frightened about the number of 30-second ads that may be thrown at you if you take these guys on, it is really quite easy. Now, I know that there are many people out there of good faith who have different ideas about how we can move forward toward a balanced budget toward deficit reduction. And I'm not saying that I have all of the answers, but let me just give you a few examples, a few examples as to how we can reduce the deficit by more than $4 trillion over the next decade. And that includes, of course, asking the wealthy and large corporations to begin paying their fair share of taxes and does not do undue harm to ordinary Americans. We can do it. We can do it. If you're concerned about deficit reduction, I am concerned about deficit reduction. But we can do it calling for shared sacrifice and in a way that does not attack programs that millions and millions of children, elderly, and working families are terribly dependent upon. Let me just give you a few ideas. And other people I know have other good ideas. First, if we simply repeal the Bush tax breaks for the top 2%. Mr. President, we could raise at least $700 billion over the next decade. That's it. Rich are getting richer. Bush gave them huge tax breaks. You repeal that, $700 billion. Now, I know that some of my Republican friends think, oh my goodness, if you don't give tax breaks to the very wealthy, it will have a negative impact on jobs. And this is the trickle-down economic theory. You give tax breaks to the rich, large corporations, and we create all kinds of great jobs. Well. You know, that idea has been tested. That idea was tested. That was the idea of former President George W. Bush. But during his eight years as president, when that idea was in effect, the private sector lost, lost over 600,000 jobs, and we had one of the worst economic decades in terms of job creation ever seen in this country. We tried that theory. We did give tax breaks to the rich and large corporations, and we lost 600,000 jobs during that 10-year period. Meanwhile, when Bill Clinton raised taxes on the top 2 percent, you know what? The world didn't quite cave in. In fact, during Clinton's presidency, we created over 22 million jobs, and he left office with a huge budget surplus. But that's just one idea. Mr. President, you heard polls say we should impose a surtax on millionaires. The vast majority of the American people believe that. If you did a 5.4 percent surtax on millionaires and billionaires, that would raise $383 billion over 10 years. Mr. President, you want another idea? At a time when our manufacturing sector is collapsing, when 50,000 factories have shut down in the last 10 years, when millions of workers have lost good-paying jobs, the United States government continues to reward companies that move U.S. manufacturing jobs overseas through loopholes in the tax code known 
as deferral and foreign source income. That clearly, from a financial point of view in terms of revenue to our government as well as policy, which results in the loss of millions of good manufacturing jobs, is not something we should sustain. If we ended that absurdity, that policy alone, the Joint Tax Committee has estimated that we could raise more than $582 billion in revenue over the next 10 years. Now, what about that? $582 billion in revenue, and we stop the outsourcing of jobs so that maybe we can rebuild our manufacturing sector. Sounds to me like a pretty sensible idea. My Republican friends think it is a better idea to throw poor children off of Medicaid or force elderly people to pay far more they can afford for Medicare. But ending this absurd policy, which encourages companies to throw American workers out on the street, makes a lot more sense to me than what the Republicans are talking about. Fourth, Mr. President, if we ended tax breaks and subsidies for big oil and gas companies, we could reduce the deficit by more than $40 billion over the next 10 years. Fifth, if we prohibited abusive and illegal offshore tax shelters, what I just talked about a moment ago, we could bring in a trillion dollars over 10 years. That says to the corporations and the wealthy, sorry, you're no longer going to be able to stash your wealth in the Cayman Islands and avoid paying taxes. Six, Mr. President, if we established a Wall Street speculation fee of less than 1% on the sale and purchase of credit default swaps, derivatives, stock options, and futures, we could reduce the deficit by more than $100 billion over the next decade and also also tell Wall Street that we're not going to tolerate uh, their outrageous behavior, which led us into this recession uh, in the first place. We are going to try to get a handle on uh, their speculation. My number seven, Mr. President, if we tax capital gains and dividends the same way that we tax, tax work, ordinary workers, we could raise more than $730 billion over the next decade. Why should somebody who clips dividend coupons pay a substantially lower tax rate than somebody who is out uh, working on, a, on our streets or as a nurse or as a teacher. Warren Buffett has often said that he pays a lower effective tax rate than his secretary. And today, the effective tax rates of the wealthiest 400 Americans is just 18 percent, the lowest on record. And on and on, Mr. President, we have a number of ideas out there, not least of which taking a hard look at the military. Uh, there are debates as to how much we can cut, but certainly we should all be in agreement that it no longer makes sense to sustain weapon systems that were built in order to fight the Cold War against the Soviet Union. They are not our enemy right now. I can tell you that I, my office, requested a GAO report that found that the Pentagon had $36.9 billion in spare parts that it does not need and which are collecting dust in government warehouses. We can do better than that. And frankly, Mr. President, in my view, and I think I speak for the majority of the people in my state of Vermont, and I suspect in this country, it is time to begin bringing the troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan at an accelerated rate. We have been in Afghanistan now for 10 years. It is time for the Afghan people and their military to take responsibility in terms of defeating the Taliban. We should be supportive of those efforts. But we should bring our troops home a lot sooner than the President has suggested. And when we do that, among other things, we also are going to save a substantial sum of money. Further, Mr. President, I will not deny for one second that there is waste and fraud and bureaucracy in almost every government program out there. I think we've got to take a hard look at them all. And I believe that in addition to the Pentagon, we can save hundreds of billions of dollars a year by eliminating unnecessary bureaucracy. Mr. President, the ideas that I've enumerated and some that I have not, but which will become part of the record, if we did all or some of these things, we could easily reduce the deficit by well over $4 trillion over the next decade, if not, in fact, much more. It would be done in a way that is fair, 
and it would not unnecessarily and needlessly ruin the lives of some of the most desperate and fragile and hurting people in our country today. Millions of people who are just struggling to make ends meet. Those people would be spared. Mr. President, the extreme right-wing agenda of more tax breaks for the wealthy paid by the dismantling of Medicare, Medicaid, education, nutrition, and the environment may be popular in the country clubs and cocktail parties of the wealthy and the powerful, but it is way out of touch with what the overwhelming majority of Americans want. Mr. President, as you know, last, late last week, Congressman Cantor, the Republican Majority Leader in the House, and Senator John Kyle, the Republican Minority Whip in the House, walked out of the budget negotiations being uh, led by Vice President Biden. And the reason they walked out was pretty clear. They were not willing to close one single loophole in the tax code that allows the wealthy and large corporations to avoid paying taxes by stashing their money in the Cayman Islands, all the other loopholes that currently exist. Mr. President, my sincere hope is that President Obama will use this Republican walkout, their unwillingness to talk about the wealthy and large corporations contributing anything to a deficit reduction, that he will use this as an opportunity to rally the American people and make it clear that he will never support Republican demands to move toward a balanced budget solely on the backs of working families, the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor. But I don't think that the President will do this unless the American people send him a message that enough is enough. The American people do not support the Republican agenda. The American people support the concept of shared sacrifice as we move toward deficit reduction. But the President has got to hear from the American people. He has got to hear that they will not accept decimating Medicare, Medicaid, Pell Grants, education, and the environment in order to give more tax breaks to the wealthy. The President has got to stand up for the millions of Americans who have seen their homes, their jobs, and their savings vanish instead of the millionaires who have never had it so good. Mr. President, it is my belief that if the American people make that demand of the President and tell the President not to yield on this issue, we can win this budget struggle. If people would like to, and I hope they would, we have a letter to the President, which I'm going to read in a moment, on my website. And also, as I mentioned earlier, they can contact the White House directly by going straight to the White House website and sending a message. And if hundreds of thousands of people do that, the President, I hope, will have the strength and the determination to say to the Republicans, sorry, we are not going to balance the budget on the weak and the vulnerable. Now, this is the letter that is on my website, sanders.senate.gov, which I hope people will sign. And this is what the letter says, which I think kind of encapsulates much of what I've been saying for the last hour. And this is what it says. It says, Dear Mr. President, this is a pivotal moment in the history of our country. Decisions are being made about the national budget that will impact the lives of virtually every American for decades to come. As we address the issue of deficit reduction, we must not ignore the painful economic reality of today, which is that the wealthiest people in our country and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well while the middle class is collapsing and poverty is increasing. In fact, the United States today has by far the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth. And the letter continues. Everyone understands that over the long term we have got to reduce the deficit, a deficit that was caused mainly by Wall Street greed, tax breaks for the rich, two wars, and a prescription drug program written by the drug and insurance companies. It is absolutely imperative, however, that as we go forward with deficit reduction, we completely reject the Republican approach that demands savage cuts in desperately needed programs for working families, the elderly, the sick, our children, and the poor.
while not asking the wealthiest among us to contribute one penny. And the letter continues. Mr. President, please listen to the overwhelming majority of the American people who believe that deficit reduction must be about shared sacrifice. The wealthiest Americans and the most profitable corporations of this country must pay their fair share. At least 50 percent, let me repeat that, at least 50 percent of any deficit reduction package must come from revenue raised by ending tax breaks for the wealthy and eliminating tax loopholes that benefit large, profitable corporations and Wall Street financial institutions. A sensible deficit reduction package must also include significant cuts to unnecessary and wasteful Pentagon spending. Please, Mr. President, do not yield to outrageous Republican demands that would greatly increase suffering for the weakest and most vulnerable members of our society. Now is the time to stand with tens of millions of Americans who are struggling to survive economically, not with millionaires and billionaires who have never had it so good. Respectfully yours. So that is the letter that it's on my website at sanders.senate.gov. I would hope, and I know I think uh, we have many, many thousands of signatures on that letter already. Uh, I would hope that we get more. If people would prefer to go to the White House website, do that. That will be important. But the main point here is that the President has got to know that we will not accept a deficit reduction package that just comes down heavily on working families. And I would say, and, and the reason I must, I, I raise these issues today, Mr. President, is I am frankly very worried uh, because we have gone through this negotiating process uh, two times in the last six months, and that is why we need the American people to weigh in on this issue. Uh, in fact, you know, we have seen this movie before. The Republicans, led by their extreme right wing, have been successful in getting their way because of their refusal to compromise and their willingness to hold the good credit and economic security of the American people hostage. As many people will remember, in December, the Republican leadership was prepared to hold the middle class tax cuts and unemployment benefits hostage in order to extend the Bush tax breaks for the top 2 percent. And as we all know, the Republicans won. And as a result, over $200 billion was added to the deficit over the next two years. Not only did the Bush tax breaks, the wealthy get extended, they also got a reduction in the estate tax, which benefits the top three-tenths of 1 percent. Specifically, the December tax cut agreement extended the Bush income tax uh, benefits, and it cost us very, very substantially. Um, Mr. President, it is not just the, uh, the Bush tax cuts that were extended. In, um, in March of this year, uh, you'll all remember that our Republican friends said that unless we made very significant cuts, uh, the Republicans were prepared to shut down the government, uh, disrupt the economy, and deny paychecks to some 800,000 federal workers if they couldn't get their way. That's what they said. We're going to shut down the government unless you make these draconian cuts. And one of the cuts that I was very disturbed about among many were $600 million to build new community health centers, which will keep people alive and in the long run end up saving money by keeping people healthy. There were other draconian cuts there as well. They also cut the Pell Grants, making it harder for students to go to college. Point is, they acted as bullies. And they said, if we don't get our way, we are prepared to shut down the government. And now we're back at it again. This is part three of the act. Uh, part one was whether or not the middle class would get its tax breaks and unemployment benefits would be extended. Republicans won. Part two is whether or not the government would be shut down. Republicans mostly won. They didn't get everything they wanted. They got almost everything they wanted. And here we are today in the biggest act of all, Act 3, and the question is whether the Republicans will, in fact, not raise the debt ceiling. And if they do that, it is quite possible that not only our country, but the entire world might be plunged into a major financial crisis.
crisis. And that is what they're threatening. If we don't get everything we want, we're prepared not to pay our government's debt for the first time in the history of our country, prepared to see interest rates go up in a very fragile global economy, prepared to see more and more instability. Mr. President, in many ways, the Republicans here in Washington are acting like schoolyard bullies. And as we know, bullying is a very serious problem in our schools. Every educator worth his or her salt would tell you that when you're dealing with a bully, you must not give in to their tactics or tolerate their temper tantrums or allow them to hurt innocent people. You have to deal with them sternly and consistently. You cannot allow them to win by dictating the rules of the game and trampling over everyone else if they don't get their way. Mr. President, we have a serious deficit problem that must be solved. No one would deny it. But it must be solved in a way that is fair, in a way that calls for shared sacrifice. So, Mr. President, let me conclude uh, by suggesting to you that the American people are concerned about the deficit, but they are also concerned about the economy, and they are also concerned that so many of our people of all ages and all parts of this country are hanging on economically by their fingernails. And the American people understand that it is just not fair, not fair at all, to come down on people who are already hurting and leave unscathed the wealthiest and wealthiest people in this country and large profitable corporations. So what I would say today to the President of the United States. Mr. President, stand tall. Do not yield to Republican blackmail. Stand with the vast majority of the American people who believe that deficit reduction requires shared sacrifice, that everybody makes the sacrifice, not just working families, not just the elderly, not just the sick, not just the poor. So with that, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would uh, yield the floor, and I believe uh, note the absence of a poem. Clerk will call the roll.